Elf is going to share with us as well. Did you bring a plastic trumpet? No plastic trumpet. Oh, Father, we thank you. Uh, we thank you for Elf. We thank you for the message that he uh, has to share with us. And we pray, God, that, um, that, Lord, that every part of this would just be imparted to us uh, as he brings it this morning. Thank you, Father. In your mighty name, amen. Amen. Isn't that fun? That's good. I love watching that. Those who are shy and Wayne's kid acting like his dad there, that was just great. <laughs> <laughs> what, what? <laughs> uh, one of the best things about Christmas is, and, and celebrating Jesus coming and being born on the earth and so on, is the, the he's given many names in the prophecy and also, you know, in the, in the New Testament and so on. And one of my favorite is Emmanuel, which means God with us. And it, it would be enough if God actually came and, 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 and lived among us, but I want to point out today how much like us he is and how much he entered into our human experience when, when he came as a baby. And so Emmanuel, I, I hope Emmanuel will, will mean a little bit more to you at the end of today. And so I just want to, uh, how many of you love genealogies? Genealogies, anybody? Okay, great. Pam and I went to the Mennonite um, museum or whatever, what's it called? Mennonite Heritage Museum. And uh, have you been there, Jack? If you, <laughs> no, no, he's not Mennonite. No, <laughs> too bad. <laughs> oh well, we can't all be perfect, can we? <laughs> so I was able to give them. If 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 you're a Mennonite and you go in there like I am, and you give them your name and your birthday, they trace in about. 10 minutes, they traced my ancestry back to 1598. Is that amazing or what? So I have, I mean, I've always known, you know, of course my parents, my grandparents, maybe my great grandparents, but that's about it, right? So now I have all these names. I mean, I, now I'm really curious about what each one of them, you know, was like and so on. But I'm sure I had some rascals in the past and some really good people, you know? And so I just, I just want to point out um, we're going to do the genealogy, we're going to look briefly, really briefly, honestly, at the genealogy of Jesus out of Matthew 1. So, how many know that the Christmas story starts with genealogy in Matthew and in Luke? And they're a little bit different uh, because they follow different lines and some uh, skipped a few uh, generations and so on as they were naming names. But it's really interesting in Matthew's version how there are five women named Yay! genealogies are usually okay these 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 were not um uh it's 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 pointed out because it's a, the women were a symbol of grace Yay! that jesus came from and why was that because you're going to find out that the women that are mentioned it was actually pretty questionable circumstances Yay! that brought these women into the royal line of Jesus. And we are still loved. We are still <laughs> Now, I, 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 might, I might quickly add that many of the men that were mentioned were pretty uh, rascally as well. Some of them were pretty terrible. Yes. You know? Yay! Yay. <laughs> All right. So, in order to keep this short, quit trying to distract me. Yeah. So starting Matthew 1, Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob. Jacob was the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Wow. So I wonder why Matthew decided to point out these women. As we go on in uh, verse 5, Salmon was the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz was the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed was the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother was Bathsheba, the widow of Uriah. 
Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. Mary gave birth to Jesus, who is called the Messiah. So there's five women that we're going to look at really quickly. And the first of which is Tamar. So, I mean, we always want to go back in our genealogy if we do that. And, and it's, it's, it's curious to find, you know, to me, to find out what kind of people these were. And so what circumstances brought about, what coincidences brought about, you know, the line that I came from. And so, you know, the line that Jesus came from. God didn't plan Jesus' genealogy or his ancestors to be perfect people. Like we say, he's the son of David, or he's, you know, he's, he's you know, he's, he's, that's used a lot. But, you know, David was a highlight, I guess, in some ways. Uh, not, not totally, you'll see, in his background. But there were some other people who were um, in questionable circumstances. So the first one is Tamar. Tamar was uh, married to Judah's son. Judah was the son of Jacob, one of the, you know, the, the 12 tribes of Israel got their names from the sons of, ja of Jacob. And so Judah was one of those tribes, or one of those men, he, you know, the tribe started out with a man, and then their line followed them. And he married a Canaanite woman, which probably wasn't cool, had some sons. Uh, cutting the, short, the story short, he finds a wife for his first son, and the wife's name is, is Tamar. So the son dies. And in those days, and right through into the New Testament, as you see one of the Sadducees are questioning Jesus about this. It's a cultural thing that if the, a man married a woman and then he died before there was a child, the man's brother was supposed to marry the woman and produce a child for, to carry on the man's name. And so this happened. Uh, Tamar's first husband died. Then Judah gave the second son to Tamar. And he also died with no children. And so Tamar is looking for the third son, and Judah says, put the brakes on that. Maybe he's scared. Everybody who marries Tamar dies. Maybe she's a black widow. You know, who knows? So at any rate, he puts her off. He says, go live as a widow. And she gets tired of waiting, and she decides to take matters into her own hand. And so what does she do? She hears that Jacob is on his way. Sorry, Judah is on his way down the road, and she disguises herself as a prostitute and seduces Judah into the bushes or wherever and guess what Tamar got pregnant and so the first woman mentioned in in Jesus genealogy disguised herself as a prostitute seduced Judah got pregnant by him and had two babies actually one of which was Perez and he is in Jesus royal line. He is in Jesus' genealogy. Interesting. I'll make sense of it quickly at the end. We'll go down to Salmon was the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Who was Rahab? Was Rahab was a prostitute. What is this? What's going on? <laughs> Rahab was a prostitute in the city of Jericho. And when the people of Israel were leaving their 40 years in the wilderness and they were about to enter into the promised land, Joshua sends a couple of spies into the city of Jericho to check them out. And for some reason, which we'll see, Rahab decides, I'm gonna protect these guys, even though they're here to wipe us out. I am going to shield these guys and hide them. So they go into her house and uh, she, they, then the officials come and somebody had seen them and the officials come and say, where's those guys that went into your house? And she says, oh, they were here, but they left and they went that way. And then she, she runs over to the guys after the officials leave and she you know, gets them out from hiding and she says, I told them you went that way, so you go that way, right? And, and here's why. It's interesting because she hid the spies and she lied to the king's men because she had a revelation. She really did. And here it is in Joshua 2. Before the spies went to sleep that night, Rahab went up on the roof to talk to them. I know the Lord has given you this land, she told them. I don't know how she knew that, but she did. We are all afraid of you. Everyone in the land is living in terror, for we have heard how the Lord made a dry path for you through the Red Sea when you left Egypt, and we know what you did to Sihon and Og, the two Amorite kings east of the Jordan River, whose people you completely destroy. No wonder our hearts have melted in fear. No one has the courage to fight after hearing such things. Listen, for the Lord your God is the supreme God of the heavens above and the earth below. 
wow, this prostitute had a revelation, didn't she? And she acted on it, and she, out of that, married somebody and became part of Jesus' genealogy. She's an ancestor of Jesus. Isn't that interesting? Wow. In Hebrews, she's actually mentioned as one of the heroes of the faith. Come on. Hebrews 11.31, it's by faith that Rahab the prostitute was not destroyed with the people in her city who, who refused to obey God, for she, was, for she gave, sorry, she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. She's so, you know, common in Jewish history that even James mentions her as well in, in, in James's letter. Next one is Ruth. Boaz was the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Now, Ruth 1, verse 3 and 4 says, After I won't tell you this whole story. After Elimelech died and Naomi was left with her two sons, the two sons married Moabite women. One of the women was named o Orpah. And the, I was going to say Oprah, but it's Orpah. No, or Oprah's not in Jesus' line. And the other was named, the other woman was named Ruth. So, Interesting, again, that this is marriage outside of God's covenant people. And that this Moabites is now part of Jesus' genealogy. So, even though in Jesus' day still, they persecuted and hated people who were not pure Jewish blood, a.k.a. the Samaritans, and really anybody else, you know, they weren't even allowed Gentile, they weren't allowed to go into a Gentile house or eat with a Gentile or... Really, if you were a really good Jew, you would never even pass through Samaria. You would walk around it. But, you know, of course, Jesus did that as well. But, it's, you know, that's how fussy they were about their genes, you know, about their, their line, their purity. And yet, wait a minute, Ruth was not part of, she was not a Jew. And yet she became part of Jesus' royal line. And so, the next one is Bathsheba. And, of course... That one we know. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother was Bathsheba, the widow of Uriah. Wow. What a way to enter Jesus' royal line. David has a complete lapse of judgment, lusts with his eyes, seduces the wife of somebody else, not just anybody else, seduces the wife of somebody who was one of his heroes, one of his main mighty men, somebody who would put his... Life and did put his life on the line in a second without a second's thought for David any day of the week. Not just random stranger, somebody who was a close personal friend. And he, David takes his wife and sleeps with her and gets her pregnant. And David goes, oh no, what am I going to do? And he arranges to have Uriah murdered. Wow. Kind of an interesting spot, but you see, out of... David and Bathsheba then, after this, comes Solomon. And the line carries on right to Jesus. So Bathsheba enters into the royal line of Jesus. So how many have we done so far? How are we doing? Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba. Let's go to Mary. What? Mary? What could we have about Mary to say that would be peculiar? about her being part of the line. The other four were like, questionable, God. I mean, Jesus probably said, Father, really? That's who I come from? <laughs> no, Jesus knew, of course. But you see, his, his human side came from, I guess you could say a checkered past, you know? Some good guys, some bad guys. Some good women, I'm sure, and some questionable. Women of questionable repute. So Mary. What about Mary? Matthew 1.18. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. Was she married to Joseph? No, not yet. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly. So he decided to break the engagement quietly. I want you to know there's nothing we can point at to Mary and say, wow, why is she chosen or why is she in Jesus' line like the other ones that we've looked at? But I want you to know something. I don't think anybody, very few people, for the rest of her life believed their story. They just thought, you're just too ashamed to own up. 
you guys had sex, you got her pregnant, and you're not willing to cough it up, so you make up this story, like a few people believed her, Zachariah and Elizabeth and so on, right? But that would have followed her and Joseph. Why don't you just own up? Like, halfway through Jesus' ministry, it says his brothers didn't even believe in him yet. They did later. We read in Acts, but, you know, so it's like, come on, guys. Are you going to carry this on your whole life, this story about how you got pregnant? You know, first one ever, like, it just doesn't happen, right? You know, we know where babies come from, you know? I, we, Pam and me discovered it after five, and so that's, that's where we ended. <laughs> Mary. Mary and Joseph. And then, of course, Jesus would have been considered illegitimate. Jesus would have been considered somebody who was born, you know, out of wedlock, although they were married by the time he was born, but you understand what I mean. And that, if that isn't a huge bad thing in some circles today, it certainly was then. It certainly was a bad mark against them, against uh, Jesus as he was growing up. So what does all this tell us about Jesus? Well, I just want to read you part of a little article out of Christianity.com, and it's it's focuses on Rahab, but I, I think it sort of says what I want to say. Many first-time Bible readers are surprised to learn that the New Testament begins with a genealogy, Jesus' family tree, and they're even more surprised when Rahab shows up on the list. Most of us know about her. She's always mentioned in the Bible as Rahab the harlot, but that's not all. Rahab was also a Canaanite who were hated enemies of Israel. Her most exemplary deed was telling a lie. That's what saved them. She lied to the king and his men. That's what saved the spies. So think about that. A harlot, a Canaanite, a liar. You wouldn't, have, you wouldn't think she had much chance of making the list, but there she is. Rahab was a harlot. That was her trade. The men hid there because people would be accustomed to seeing strangers come and go at all hours of the night. We can't deny the fact that Rahab told a bald-faced lie. Is there anything good to say about her? Yes, she was a woman of faith. And I read you the scripture. She had a revelation. Your God is the God of the heavens above and the earth below. We don't stand a chance. So I'm switching sides, you know. And because of that, she's not only saved herself and her family, but she's part of Jesus' royal line. She's in the genealogy of Jesus. So many people are intimidated by Jesus. They hook him up with a lot of religious stuff. A lot of religion. I'm still reading from the, from the article here. Religious paraphernalia. We sometimes have big sanctuaries, stained glass windows, beautiful choirs, pipe organs, formal prayers, liturgies, and all the rest. When people look at all the trappings, it's very intimidating to them. To many in the world today, Jesus seems so far above. Too good to be true. But the genealogy is in the Bible to let us know that he had a background a lot like yours and mine. Wow. Wow. Jesus didn't have a pristine heritage on his human side. But that doesn't bother him. He identifies with us in every detail, even this. And that's where I started today. Emmanuel means God with us. God really is with us. He's not the, you know... Yes, he is God. He is the king of the universe. He is, you know, everything. You couldn't say enough good things and high things to, to, to adequately describe him. And yet, Jesus came to us in humility, with a checkered, you know, ancestry as we've gone through. And, and, and himself lived with a sort of a cloud of doubt hanging over his whole life and his legitimacy and his parents and so on who his parents really were. And yet, he didn't let that, his heritage, or what people thought of him because of this, identify him. He knew who he was. He said, I know who I am. The father told him, you are my son, and I am well pleased in you. And that's all that needed to matter to Jesus, you see. He could have said, well, father, yeah, I'm so glad you, because look, you know, no, he, he took his identity, I am the son of God. That's what, that's what his identity was. And so, his heritage doesn't define him. In fact, it makes him much more approachable. 
to ordinary people like us who have no great claim to fame, who can't look back and go, you know, maybe some of us can, maybe some of us have great heroes in our past, but I bet you, you know, those are the guys you, you mentioned when you, you know, if, if you know of any, in, you know, in your, in your past, you know, if, oh yeah, well, my great grandfather was so-and-so. Well, yeah, let me tell you about your great grandmother or whatever, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> if truth were known, None of us come from pristine backgrounds. And so Jesus, Father, decides to make his experience of humanity to, to be just like ours. To be just like ours. And Luke 19, verse 10 says, For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. Luke 15, 1 and 2, Tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus. Isn't it interesting? I wonder if notorious sinners and tax collectors, you know, would go, as, as the article said before, to the, to the cathedrals and the stained glass, stained glass windows and the formal liturgies and all that. You know, maybe, sure. But Jesus didn't identify so much with the religious leaders of the day, as you know, if you read the Gospels. He identified, although he, the door was wide open for them, and many of them did end up following him later. But he, I, he, he was so, um, if I can say this, you know, with, uh, you know, without meaning, demeaning him, he was so common that ordinary sinners and ordinary people who were despised by the authorities and religious leaders of the day could freely associate with him. He was called the friend of sinners. And so, yeah. There's a quote from a book by Bob Eckblad that he just gave me, his recent book called Guerrilla Bible Studies. And one of the uh, Bible studies, he goes into uh, the idea of Jesus being the friend of sinners. And he says, the Pharisees and scribes might be interpreting Jesus' embrace of sinners as an endorsement of their behavior, which he was not. But they would have uh, associated it that way. And they might be unsettled by the way he's modeling actions that they're not willing to take. So are we, if we are followers of Jesus, here's where I want to bring it to. Are we followers of Jesus? Yes. If we are followers of Jesus, then we need to follow his example. He was and allowed himself to associate with people who were sinners. Wow, he's got sinners in his background. He knew that. We read about them today. And there's many, many others. The men, you know, I just focused on the women because they stand out a little bit. The other... Genealogies usually just talk about men, but, you know, there's, there's a lot of, of stuff in his background that made him, he didn't really need to have a pristine human heritage in order to feel like he was important. He was the son of God, and that was his identity. So, remember, Jesus accepted anyone in whatever condition they were. Do we? Are we followers of Jesus? Are we in process of learning how to yes. embrace yes. and befriend sinners? Yes. Well, the story of, G of, of Christmas is Emmanuel. God is with us. God is at, at Jesus in, his, in the way I've talked about today. Jesus is like us. We are like him in that way. But we cannot let our heritage or our background or even what's happened to us in our lifetime define who we are. Because that's not who we are if we're children of God. We're children of the king of the universe. So no matter what has happened to us, we can lift up our head and square our shoulders and say, I belong to, the, to God. I'm part of God's family. I'm a son or daughter of the king of the universe. And so our situations, our background does not need to define who we are. God with us. He embraced our condition, even in this area. So remember that Jesus came as a baby, as God's gift to all of mankind. You know, it says that God is not willing that any should perish. Right? God opens the door to anyone, whatever situation, whatever background, whatever circumstance, whatever sin has been in our lives. He opens the door and says, you too, if you believe in who as many as believed him... To them gave he the right to become the children of God. Amen. Wow. Isn't that amazing? 
All this occurred, Matthew 1, to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Is there someone or some group of people that we avoid or that we hide from or that we don't want anything to do with or that we're afraid we'll get dirty if we get near them? Is there? We're in process. We're learning how to be followers of Jesus. We're learning how to embrace them without endorsing their actions. We're learning to love on them because the door is open to all of them as well to embrace being a son or daughter of the king. So let's keep our eyes open this Christmas season. And when you think about and sing about, as we did today, you know, Emmanuel, Emmanuel, God with us, think about this. Think about that Jesus came in a situation much like yours and mine. Typical situation, some good people in the past, some bad people in the past, but that did not identify him. That was not his identifying factor. He said, I am a child of God. I will represent my father accurately and completely and truthfully. And in that, I will be a friend to sinners. And I will be, be there to welcome them, as he did to Matthew, the tax collector, into not only into the kingdom of God, but into close discipleship with Jesus. Are we willing to do that? Are we willing to learn to continue or to continue to learn to embrace people that God might bring us in contact with who we have so far been avoiding? Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for who you are. Thank you that you love us the way we are. You don't hold, against, you don't hold our heritage against us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Because if you did, who could stand and who could, who could claim cleanness all the way back? You didn't. And you, you, you say by that 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 is not necessary. But what is necessary is that we believe in you, Jesus. That we, that we become children of you, Father. And that in that, we will follow your lead in learning how to embrace people with your love that are all around us, even those who we might have to this point have real trouble with. We will do so because you did it and because we're followers of you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So everyone that would like to, uh, you know, allow the Lord to stretch a little bit in loving people this season and, and throughout the new year that's coming, would you stand up? And it's okay, don't feel pressured. If you don't want to be loving more people this year, we totally understand. You know? <laughs> maybe you got your plate full, you know? And uh, maybe Al scared you when he said, how about the people around you you don't like? Like, I bet some of you right away thought about one or two and went, uh-uh, no, not going to happen. So we just need to pray for more grace. But for those that are standing, so just hold your hands out. And so Holy Spirit, you see every hand that's open right now. And that is our way of admitting to you that we can't love the unlovable by ourselves. We can't love those that have offended us or betrayed us, ignored us, blocked us, unfriended us, um, choose not to talk to us or walk away in anger. But with your grace in us, we ask that you would show us. How can we show love? Not, not a fakey love but truly, Lord, that we could see them through your eyes so that when we see them, it doesn't sting, that we can actually have empathy, sympathy, and forgiveness towards them. So those whose hands are up, we say, fill them up. And those, Lord, that are sitting, we just pray if there's people in their life, they say, uh-uh, not right now, just can't do it. Father, we just pray that you continue to pour healing into hearts that need to expand their forgiveness and mostly, Lord, they need to know how loved they are so that they can love the others more easily. You haven't counted our sins against us, so help them in their journey too. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.